Tēnā koutou katoa. I'm Rachel Brown and it's a real pleasure to welcome you all and also to introduce you, uh, introduce uh, Professor Sheila Skeef, who has been invited to present the Muriel Bell Lecture this year. Now, Muriel Bell was, of course, an esteemed nutritionist and medical researcher, and each year we do have a public lecture held in her name uh, to celebrate the career of those who have made outstanding contributions to nutrition, and this year it is Sheila Skeef. Now, this lecture is usually part of the Nutrition Society Conference, but we were really mindful that we already had uh, two packed days of conference, and we thought we did not want to over-Zoom everybody, so we decided to hold this lecture separately so that you were all fresh. Now, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Sheila, maybe from her research, or maybe from her many years of service to the Nutrition Society, or maybe she taught many of you um, as she taught me. And those of you who have been lucky enough to have been taught by her would not be surprised that her teaching has been recognized with a National Tertiary Teaching Excellence Award. So a little bit of background, uh, Professor Sheila Skeesh, she has a Master's of Science degree in Nutritional Biochemistry from the University of Guelph in Canada. She then she saw the light and moved to New Zealand and got a PhD in Human Nutrition at the University of Otago. Sheila has lots of different research interests, including iodine, food literacy, and sustainable foods and diets. She sits on the Trans-Tasman Expert Working Group for Iodine and is currently reviewing the nutrient reference values for iodine. She's also a steering committee member of Food Waste Innovation, which is a University of Otago research theme. And as I mentioned earlier, Sheila's really made a significant contribution to the Nutrition Society, where she served as president for six years. Uh, she is also currently the chair of the Oceania Nutrition Leadership Program. So yesterday I was reading uh, an article on Muriel Bell, and I did see uh, some things that quite nicely aligned with Sheila. Muriel Bell did do a thesis in basal metabolism and goiter, and she was also a huge advocate for fluoridation. And this, of course, is an area where Sheila has done several studies. Muriel Bell also had an established reputation for doing research for the public good. And so I'm sure she would be very supportive of Sheila's work in food waste. Now, Sheila's lecture is titled Lick the Plate Clean, the Intersection of Food, Nutrition and Waste. And when she told us she was going to have a photo taken of her licking the plate, we were a little worried, but I think it turned out rather well. So thank you, Sheila. And so, Sheila, with this Lick the Plate Clean, we look very forward to hearing your interpretation of this phrase. So thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Rachel, for that very kind introduction. And I'm not sure when to start. I'll wait till you leave and I come in. Oh, there we are. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. So I will start. So Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa, no Canada Aho, Ko Skif Tefano, Ko Sheila Aho, Kanuiti Mihi, Kiakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto. So this is a public lecture, and I'm quite aware that it's a public lecture. And I also am aware that a couple of years ago, I gave another public lecture, which was my uh, IPL or professorial lecture. And I didn't really want to overlap things because I think it's really boring to hear things too many times. So this is kind of a little bit different approach. Um, there's a lot of basic kind of information that many of you will know, but it never hurts to hear things um, two, three, 10, 20 times, does it? Um, and really the focus of the lecture is to get people to think about their own or the people around us, some of our behaviors and our practices and the choices that we can make as individuals with regard to food, nutrition and food waste. So I'm just sort of putting that out there. So just gonna continue. and if. Oh, who's the last person in this room? Thank you for the people in the room that are here. And some of you will have listened. 
But if you know with my, a lot of my lectures, I tend to start, uh, this is a habit I've kind of developed with a, a definition. Okay, so if you're answering, I always say when you're answering a short answer question, you know, think about that, like get a definition in there to get some more marks. So this is a definition from the World Health Organization of nutrition. It's not the greatest definition, but I've put it in here. Nutrition is the intake of food considered in relation to the body's dietary needs. Ah, oh, yeah, it's okay. I mean, there's lots of definitions of nutrition. I like the next part better. It says good nutrition an adequate, well-balanced diet combined with res regular physical activity is the cornerstone of good health. So that kind of leads me on to Dr. Muriel Bell. And Rachel has alluded to um, Dr. Bell and what she's done. And I have took, taken with my uh, phone a picture of this book. So uh, Diana Brown has written a very good book about Dr. Muriel Bell called The Unconventional Career of Dr. Muriel Bell. And I just want to say that she was born in 1898 and died in 1974, which is a fairly significant time in the history of humanity, but also in the history of food and nutrition. And so I'm just going to read the back blurb, um, which I think Diana wrote about Muriel Bell, because it gives you a little bit of more information than what Rachel gave you. It says, whether or not you have heard of pioneering nutritionist Muriel Bell, she has had a profound effect on your health. Appointed New Zealand's first state nutritionist in 1940, a position she held for almost a quarter century, Muriel Bell was behind groundbreaking public health schemes such as milk in schools, iodized salt, and water fluoridation. As a lecturer in physiology from 1923 to 1927, she had been one of the first women academics at Otago Medical School the second woman in New Zealand to be awarded a re the research degree of Doctor of Medicine in 1926. Then it goes on to say, at the base of her commitment to science lay a deep social concern, especially for women and children. In service to this cause, Muriel Bell worked tirelessly. Her nutritional advice, common sense to us today, but revolutionary at the time. So we're gonna talk more about that uh, in the lecture. And then it goes on to say, in 1937, she became a foundation member of the Medical Research Council, serving for two decades, while simultaneously she was the sole woman on the Board of Health. I mean, it's pretty phenomenal. And I understand that, you know, it wasn't like we had planes and you were able to go up to Wellington. It was quite a long way to get there from Dunedin. Muriel Bell was a trailblazer by anyone's definition, unswervingly committed to the understanding that we are what we eat, that nutrition is a cornerstone of individual and public health. So I think, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that Muriel Bell does, but she's really um, played a fundamental role here with nutrition in New Zealand. And I guess what I want to sort of do in the lecture today is, you know, the things that she worked on, which seemed, you know, quite groundbreaking back in the 1920s and 30s and 40s up to the 19, uh, early 1960s. How far have we come? You know, or what, what, let's have a look at that, because I think mm, it'll be interesting you, you think about that. So in addition to many bits of research that she did, she graduated in 1922 from medical school, and then she got the Doctor of Medicine in 1926, and then she did various different things. And in 1944, she wrote a book called Good Nutrition, okay? And Good Nutrition, okay, 1944, was filled with recipes and weekly menus that included adequate amounts of milk, vegetables and fruit, and offered alternatives to New Zealanders' traditionally high intake of meat, butter, and sugar. So it's like, like, have we moved on or what's happening? It's interesting. So let's continue. So that's what information that Muriel thought was practical for health professionals, including dietitians at that time. So how have we moved on? So what is good nutrition? in 2021. So again, don't forget it's a public lecture. I'm looking at you in this room. So how do we, you know, how do we decide now what is good nutrition? Well, we do have these, what we call visual food guides. And many of you who are older uh, will know about the healthy food pyramid. That is not recommended to be used as much. Uh, we've now got that very nice one in the middle of the, of the slide, which is the heart foundation. And you can see at the top, it's kind of a uh, stylized heart and eat most vegetables and fruit, okay? And then over on the, I guess it's the right-hand side, 
is one that was produced by um, the, in Canada in 2019. And what you can see there is we've got a plate and half the plate has got uh, plenty of vegetables and fruit. I want you to be aware that when wording, okay, it doesn't say fruits and vegetables, it says vegetables and fruits. Those wordings are actually quite important, okay? And people spend a lot of time talking about them in their committees. We've got protein foods, okay? Dairy was out, okay, for this, and that was a little controversy. We have choose whole grain foods and then make water your drink of choice. Okay, so that's, but underlying these visual food guides are actual documents that um, underpin the information. And I have got here, the, I printed it up. Okay, you can see it's quite, hopefully you get that feeling that it's quite thick. This is the eating and activity guidelines for New Zealand. But if you were to print up or get the copy of the dietary guidelines for Americans, which is from 20 to 25, or the very old dietary guidelines for Australians, which they're, they're redoing now. They've just appointed a panel uh, or a committee to look at that. They're quite outdated. And if you look at these eating and activity guidelines, they look simple, but in fact, there's a lot more to them, okay? And this next, so what you can see is, I'm just gonna show you in the New Zealand ones, they have a series of eating statements. I'm not gonna go through those. You will have seen them. You can get this information online. They have a series of uh, body, um, uh, uh, one on body size, as well as one on physical activity. And the eating statements are pretty similar to what Muriel Bell said. We've got eat plenty of vegetables and fruit, uh, grain foods, mostly whole grains, et cetera, so milk and things. And then we can see these other ones about what we should prepare our foods with unsaturated fats, use little or added sugar. And then if you use salt, use iodized salt. So that, that I'm not, I don't wanna go through those all those eating statements and um, but just to show you that they're there and a lot of you if I asked you what they were you would already know them now underpinning I think the point I'm trying to make is underpinning these statements is evidence and that is a change from possibly when when Muriel Bell was around okay is that we have a lot more evidence supporting these statements okay and of course you can't read that I don't expect you to read that but what I want to show you is this thing that says the evidence that underpins the statements. Okay, and that is a change. So if you go into any of these food and nutrition guidelines that are produced by different countries around the world, you will see often listed the evidence that underpins these. Okay, it just didn't kind of come out of the air. It's come from various different studies and research. Okay, saying that, okay, how important is nutrition in human health? Well, nutrition is, obviously we're sitting in nutrition department, so we know nutrition and food, we've got food scientists, is very important. I'm talking to nutrition society, but nutrition is very important, obviously plays a fundamental or the cornerstone of health. But there are other factors that affect health and we need to be aware of those. And I've put up here, um, I'm not gonna go into, cause I'm not into health promotion, but we've got some other models of health Okay, well, one is Māori and we've got a Pacific model, but there's a lot of things that affect health and well-being, not just nutrition. So I do want to make sure that we haven't forgotten about that. And then really on, on the, what is I'm trying to think, is on the right-hand side of the slide, there's an infographic that is produced by, uh, it says the Lancet at the bottom, but it's a much more recent um, inform informatic that talks about socioeconomic status and how that can play a role. And it shows the transition from um, the 1950s to 2019. And I've put this up here because I'm trying to lead you in to a good place for people in the public to source information about the role of nutrition in health. So this informatic that I showed you on the previous slide was produced by the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation, okay? And this is an organization that collects data from lots of different countries around the world. And it is looking at what we call the global burden of disease. So this is different from Muriel Bell. During Muriel Bell's time, although she did work in various different countries, she was very much focused in New Zealand, okay? Now we've kind of moved and we can take information from New Zealand. We can take information from other countries. And this institute pools all that information together so we have a much wider database and much stronger evidence. And I've just taken the uh, sort of when you click on the, on, the, on the World Wide Web, you get this. I'm just sort of showing you that. But what it 
says here is it says this this particular figure is about COVID. There's lots of stuff there about COVID, but it says um, this is the most comprehensive global study analyzing 286 causes of death. I can't I feel like I'm losing my thing if I turn around. Um, 369 diseases and injuries, 87 risk factors in 204 countries and territories. So it's basically pooling. So we have much stronger evidence to underpin the role of nutrition and health. This is a paper that was published last year in The Lancet, which is a very um, reputable uh, and highly cited with a high impact factor medical journal. And it is titled The Global Burden of These 87 Risk Factors in 204 Countries, et cetera. Okay, and it's from 1990 to 2019. And it's a systematic analysis for the global burden of disease study. Now, I'm not going to go through this paper. I'm not going to go through systematic analysis. I'm not going to do that. What I want to show you is just two figures, okay, taken from this paper. So this one, this first figure is looking at males. So what we're doing is we're looking at the number of deaths, okay, from various different diseases. Those diseases are listed down on the right-hand side of the slide. We've got cardiovascular disease, a whole variety of different diseases. And then what you can see on the left-hand side is the risk factors, okay, the different risk factors. And I think what's important here, which I'm trying to stress, is you can see we've got high systolic blood pressure is the second, and then dietary risk for males is number three. So it's in the top five. Okay, very important. Diet. Diet is something that we can change and do something about, and yet it's up here. Okay, so often when we think about health, we think about it sometimes in the short term, like we're thinking about COVID and about food safety in the short term. But when we look at long term health, we also have to be thinking about the foods that we eat. So this is for males, and then for females, okay, tobacco falls down, further down, and when we get the dietary risk goes up to number two. Okay, so that is trying to really show you that when you pool data from all around the world uh, and look at the role of diet and nutrition, it plays a significant role in health. It's very important, okay? And that is something that needs to be considered, and I'm not sure it is always considered and taken as seriously as it could, particularly um, by government. Okay, so mention this. Many factors affect health, not just diet, but I want to talk about very briefly about the sustainable development goals, because that kind of looks at more of a holistic approach. So the sustainable development goals, if you take my first year paper, you learn about the sustainable development goals. There are 17 different goals. Uh, they were adopted by the United Nations member states in 2015, and they sh provide a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet now and into the future. So they're from 2015 to 2030, okay? There are 17 SDGs, okay? And they go on and they sort of talk about that all countries around the world have to work in global partnership. They recognize that ending poverty and other deprivations must go hand in hand with strategies that improve health and education, reduce inequality and spur economic growth, all while tackling climate change and working to preserve our oceans and forests. So you will see that number two, which I know is a little bit hard to read, is zero hunger. We've got good health and well-being. And then if you look at number 12, it's responsible consumption and production. We've also got climate action is 13, life below water is 14, but there's many different goals. And they have a number of different targets under them, but they do all work together, okay? Uh, and that's important. So, you know, if you, life below water has things that will impact on hunger and on food and on diet. Okay, so they are all interrelated. I'll come back to the SDGs uh, a little bit later. So I just wanna say that when we're looking at health, obviously it's more than just food and diet. There's a whole variety of factors and the sustainable development goals are targets to try to improve this uh, for all of humanity. Now, we've been talking about human health or personal health, or I've been talking about human and personal health, but I wanna talk also about planetary health, okay? Now I'm gonna talk about something I'm sure many of you heard about, which is Eat Lancet Commission or the Eat Lancet Diet. Now, it's not because I think the Eat Lancet Diet is amazing, I just wanna talk about it because it's a good example of how things have progressed from when Muriel Bell was around, okay? So the Eat Lancet Commission, this was a report, I have it here, I have the summary report here, 
was a report um, published in January 2019. Again, it was a collaboration with an NGO based out of Sweden called EAT, and then Lancet, which is the medical journal. Okay, and you can see it was co-chaired by, it says Walter Willett and Johan Rockström, and it brought people together from all around many different countries in various fields, including human health, agriculture, political science, and environmental sustainability. So why, 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 do, why am I talking about this? Well, it kind of leads into basically the Eat Lancet diet, okay, is looking at or suggests ways to improve human health as well as planetary health. It's got those two factors there. And so you can see here uh, on the left-hand side, it says healthy diets from sustainable food systems, and it's got food, planet, health. And the aim or the goal of the Eat Lancet is to ensure that we can produce enough food uh, for uh, 10 billion people in 2050 in a way that doesn't have damage to the planet. Okay, so and I want to talk a little bit about the Eat Lancet just as an example. So how are they going to do this? How do these, how does the commission, the group of people who support, put this together, um, suggest we do this? So they, it's going to be achieved by three actions. A dietary shift, okay, by having food waste, you can see where I'm going with this, okay, and improve food production. Now, I'm not going to talk about food production. I'm not, you know, an agricultural specialist, but we do need to produce food in a smarter way. And um, people like Phil and others up to doing that in the, you know, people who are working in agriculture. I'm going to talk about dietary shift in the having food waste. Um, so those are the three actions. Now, very busy slide. Don't get too worried about it. I'm just going to take you through it a little bit. This is in the report. Okay. And what we're looking at here is at the top, okay, of the slide, you have what are called the boundaries or the limits or the goals that we're trying to reach with regard to greenhouse gas emissions, with cropland use, with how much water is being used, with application of nitrogen, with fertilizers, phosphorus, and how much biodiversity loss there is. Okay, so these are called these kind of boundaries, these kind of limits that we're trying to kind of, you know, follow so that we don't go over them and make things worse. And then over on the left hand side, we've got three columns. We've got production, we've got waste and diet. So um, what you can see with production is BAU. Okay, and I was like, first time I was like, what is it? BAU? Business as usual. Okay, so if you don't know what BAU is now, you know, I don't know, it's three letter acronym business as usual. And then what we've got is production. And then we've got production plus. So that's even some more higher level production of food. And then we've got our waste. So you can see they've only got two scenarios, full waste and having waste. There's no in between there. Whereas with the production, they've got three BAU production and production plus. And then with the diet, they've just got two scenarios, business as usual, which is the eating the way they were eating now. Okay. And then the dietary shift, which I'm going to talk about. Okay. So what you want to look at in this is in 2010, it says baseline at 2010 at the very top, we've got a lot of red. You know, it's got that traffic, that traffic light system is everywhere, isn't it? So we've got that traffic light system, everybody understands the traffic lights. So we've got a lot of red, we've got a couple of green, and we've got one yellow, okay? Now, don't worry about everything until just go to the very bottom line. The bottom line is where you get the most green, you've got no red left, and you've just got some yellow. Okay, so that is increased food production or more efficient food production. We're having food waste and we're implementing the dietary shift. Okay, and that's what they're saying is going to help us have both human health and good for the planet. All right, so in their document, this is their diet. It looks a lot like the one out of Canada. Okay, what you can see is that there's a plate no, they always use plates. Plates are flat. I guess they're easier to, to use in a bowl. Um, it's flat. And you can see that half the plate has got mostly, it looks like vegetables to me. I don't, is it fruit there? Maybe. Hard to tell. And then you've got a bunch of other kind of pies. And so the yellow, the mustardy color, that's whole grains. Okay. The blue one is dairy. So that's the proportion in a day that you might eat kind of overall. The, the pale green one is plant-based proteins, okay? And then what you can see is they've, it's a bit hard to see, but here they've kind of broken them down. Don't, don't worry too much about, obviously you can't see those from where you are. This is also put down in kind of macronutrient content, okay? So looking at um, 
basically grams per day. So we've got whole grains here. We've got potatoes and cassava. They don't, you know, they're anti the potatoes, the starchy vegetables. Personally, we'll talk more about that. It's not, it's not my, I don't agree with that. Uh, but they've got vegetables, they've got fruits, dairy products. And you can see that on a daily basis, like beef, lamb and pork together is 14 grams a day, which is like not even a tablespoon. So it's really not very much. Okay. So tiny, tiny amounts for that. But then the legumes are quite, you know, are more. And then we've got the fats and sugars. And then over on the right hand side, they've got, they've got it in kilocals rather than kilojoules, but basically, and it adds up to a 2,500 kilocal or about 8,000 kilojoule diet. Okay, so here's the recommendation. And I guess the question is, you know, how, how practical is that? You know, it's good for planetary health, they're suggesting it's good for dietary health. I think there's evidence to show that, but we, I think we really do need to think about that. So let's see if it works. Last week, and I think Elaine Rush, she's not online now, but she's, she put, posted this on Twitter and I had just seen it. Um, out of Nature, there was this article that was published about the uh, Eat Lancet diet called Healthy Diets for People and Planet. And I guess what I liked about it is I love this graphic. You can get these amazing, people are doing these amazing graphics now. So I thought this is a great graphic. Um, and it's really a kind of a comment. And it says the ideal diet should be nutritious without threatening natural, re natural resources. Researchers are trying to decide what's best for countries from Kenya to Sweden. Okay. And again, this is not me writing it. So it's really good when other people write things and you can just read them out. Um, so it says, emissions on the menu. Producing food generates so much greenhouse gas pollution that at the current rate, even if nations cut all non-food emissions to zero, they still wouldn't be able to limit temperature rise to 1.5 degrees, the climate target for the Paris Agreement. A large proportion of emissions from the food systems, they estimate 30 to 50%, that seems high, comes from the livestock supply chain because animals are efficient at converting feed to food. It seems high to me. Um, goes on to say, but if everyone on average ate a more plant-based diet, so this is where I'm coming back to making those choices that we can make, okay, and emissions from all other sectors were halted, the world would have a 50% chance of meeting the 1.5 degree climate change target. And if diets improved alongside broader changes in the food system, such as cutting down food waste, the chance of hitting the target would rise to 67%. So that's quite an impact. Now they have, what about other countries? Like how close you know, are we to meeting this planetary diet? So the planetary diet or the Eat Lancet diet is over on the left-hand side. So it kind of looks like piles of gelatin, it seems to me, um, with different colors. So the vegetables are green, which is great. The dairy is kind of a, kind of a creamy yellow. The whole grains is my, what you might think. The fruits are purple. And so over what you can see over in the figure is the global average. Okay, you, so you can see that doesn't align with the planetary or the Eat Lancet diet, and then how different regions or parts of the world are comparing. Okay, so I guess I think within a New Zealand context, we might be the most like North America and Europe, okay, where we've got uh, quite a bit of dairy in our diet, we've got animal protein, we have vegetables, but they're not maybe as much as they could. The grains, the whole grains, not all grains, just whole grains, because that's an important distinction, are relatively low. Uh, what else? The fruits. I don't think the fruits. I think we're probably doing uh, pretty well on fruits. And then we have higher starchy vegetables like potatoes, which personally I don't think is an issue. But it just shows you that there's a lot of diversity. And I think that's important. And we'll bring, we'll come to that when I talk about some of the limitations of the Eat Lancet diet. Okay. So given this is happening in different parts of uh, the world and they've made these comparisons. I guess it would be of interest. I think it would be of interest. We thought it would be of interest. Bernard and myself, Bernard Venn and myself to see how is New Zealand doing? I mean, how are our diets doing? And so I would like to talk about a very small study. So I always think it's nice to have presentations that give you some data that no one's ever seen, um, except for the people who examine the thesis. So that's kind of interesting, uh, but it is a very small study and I have to make that. So could New Zealand follow the Eat Lancet? Like where are we in comparison to that recommendation? So I'm gonna talk about the Sundial study, which is a small study that was done, uh, a survey of nutrition, dietary assessment and lifestyles of adolescent 
females and males that was carried out in, in New Zealand. So it was a cross-sectional study of adolescent girls. I'm just gonna talk about the girls who aged between 15 and 19 years, it was conducted out of the Department of Human Nutrition. There was eight centers around New Zealand, 19 schools. Um, they did a whole variety of different measurements, a lot of surveys online, they got blood measures. They, I mean, there's a lot of people in this room that know a lot more about it than I do, but they also measured dietary intake. And I believe it's two 24-hour recalls. I did check this with Meredith. Um, and the primary investigators uh, for this study were Meredith Petty, and I want to thank Meredith for setting, setting, us, setting me up here because she's uh, very good at doing that, and Jill Hazard. And these are the MSC results of Imad uh, uh, Al-Sayed, who is from Saudi Arabia, and he was supervised by myself and um, Bernard Venn. And so what did we find? What did he find? So I'm going to talk about two aspects. So basically, he took their data set. Okay, and he looked at how it compared. So he had to regroup the foods into the Eat Lancet targets. And then the other thing that Ima did is he had to, with the help of Liz, uh, a lot of help from Liz, I think, uh, Liz Fleming, he also recoded and put another code in the data set. So what he did is he coded every single food item that these girls ate, okay, as either plant or animal. Okay, so obviously, if it's an apple, it's plant. If it's a steak, it's animal. Okay, but then when you get to mix foods, like, uh, say, it's a cake, then you've got to take it down to each of its ingredients and code that as plant or animal. I have to say that the very first question he asked me is, what do I code? How do I code water? Okay. Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, I don't know. Well, I'll just leave that with you. Okay. Uh, we didn't come up, we decided not to worry about that. So this is some of the results. We had 254, or the, the study generated, uh, 254 that was um, collected by various different uh, masters of dietetics students from around, around the country. What you can see is that this population of girls um, is a fairly high representation of New Zealand, European and other, and I've also got the Asian girls in there as well, because sometimes they were separated out. We've got uh, not a bad proportion of Māori uh, girls and then Pacific's rather low. Um, you can see the breakdown from the NZEP DEP. Okay, so low deprivation, about 40%. So it's not, it's not terrible, but it's not, it's a little bit skewed data. Okay. The other thing was, is that we asked, or we shouldn't say we, they asked the girls to um, self-identify or to self-categorize themselves as whether they were an omnivore or vegetarian. Okay, and you can see we've got 85% of that group were omnivores and then the other 15% were vegetarian. So how do their diets of these kind of normal average girls, maybe, you know, more pocky high, more less deprived girls um, compare with the Eat Lancet targets? So... Okay, so I haven't put up every category here. What I've put up is just some of the categories to show the difference. So what you can see is this is the percent of dietary energy, okay? So the percent of dietary energy from whole grains, it had to say whole grains, it had to be whole grain pasta or whole grain bread, okay? Is under 10% and eat Lancet dietary target is 32%, so like a lot lower, right? Um, you can see that we're eating in New Zealand more kind of potato based, probably more potato and starchy vegetables like pumpkin and stuff. And so that's higher than the Lancet. The vegetables are a little higher. Personally, don't think that's too much of a problem. Fruits are a little bit higher, not really an issue. Dairy, of course, we'd expect to be a lot higher than the Eat Lancet more than twice. Beef, lamb and pork for the omnivores is a lot higher, okay, than the 1.2% of energy that eat that Eat Lancet recommends chicken and poultry, legumes. So let's not, we're not eating much when we're an omnivore, but when you're a vegetarian, you hope you're having more legumes. Uh, that was 6.5, but still the target is 11.3. And nuts and seeds are, are quite a bit lower than what the Eat Lancet target is. Now I haven't got everything up there because it didn't fit into the slide, but when we use the strict categories of the Eat Lancet, what we found was we were missing 22% of energy. I see Liz at the back going, what? That's because Liz, there was no category in the Lancet for refined grains, okay? So the refined grains, so like the flour that you find in your cakes and biscuits and a lot of the breads went into that category. So that kind of tells us one thing. I think it tells us that 
uh, eat Lancet, okay, I think they're missing an important category. I don't think we should throw out refined grains just because I don't think, you know, I'm, poor. I'm gonna talk more about bread. Um, but also what kind of shift you would have to make to make it fit more of a New Zealand context, okay? So that kind of shows we're kind of a little bit away. So coming back to the um, Nature article that was published, one of the things that the author said last week when it was published is that the Eat Lancet diet is not a one size fits all diet. It, that's, that's probably fairly common sense, okay? There's a number of problems or issues with the Eat Lancet diet that have to be addressed. And this has created a lot of kind of comment. So issues that need to be resolved, it for some populations is quite costly, particularly if you're thinking about the nuts, okay? That's a costly thing. So we have to sort of think about that. What are we gonna do about refined grains? I personally don't think I think there's nothing wrong with, re, you know, some processed refined grains. That's not an issue. Um, they also say we need to have more of a local focus. So it's not as a one size fits all. We need to find things that fit locally that would, you know, provide protein or whatever. We also need to consider the bioavailable nutrients, particularly for iron and zinc and found in some of our animal products, particularly for some population groups. It may be more of an issue than for other groups. And then behavior change, how are we going to, how could we ever move to that diet? I mean, there might be some people that are following that, but that's a massive issue. Now in the article, she talks about the use of uh, school lunches as being a very good way of making small changes um, to, and it's, it's quite interesting. She says, you know, you can make small changes to school lunches without people being aware that get people to move along that path, particularly for children and getting them to move along that way. And, and I, I thought that was interesting. So we just need to be aware of that. Okay, so I've talked about the diet and the dietary shift. And you can see that, you know, perhaps I'm, I am suggesting that we do move to more, we make these choices about a more plant-based diet, not saying that we want to throw out meat, but we just need to think about that, reduce, um, reduce some meat, certainly for some people. Um, but also the other strategy that I want to talk about next is waste, because having waste is a key strategy for the Eat Lancet Commission. So, and that's an area of, of research for me. So food waste, okay, sometimes or often you hear the term food loss and waste. Now, I, this is a, a figure that I, I saw that I've copied from a, from a paper. And this is what they're kind of showing that often, particularly at production, Okay, the farmers, they don't like to think that they're, it's not food waste, they consider it as food loss. So at these parts of the, of the food supply chain, at production, post harvest and processing, we might consider it food loss. And then at retail in the supermarket and the consumer, we might consider it as food lace, food waste, but together it's food loss and waste. It doesn't really matter, it's along the chain. And, whoops. This accounts for about 30 to 40% of all food produced around the world, okay, is basically wasted. And that's a huge amount. That's got huge implications uh, for obviously the resources um, that we are using to put into those foods, but also if things go to landfill, more greenhouse gas emissions, all that kind of thing, which I think are very obvious. But what I wanna focus on is the nutrition. Cause sometimes I think we, we need to also think about what nutrients are we throwing away or not using? Now, when I practiced this talk a couple of days ago, um, I had I found all these great video clips that I wanted to show, but I ran out, I don't have any time to show them. So I won't do that, but I just wanted to point out some of them. Uh, I'm not gonna link them. Very short one from the UN on stop food waste. There's a great interactive one that came out in March this year called McKinsey for Kids, which for food waste and looking for kids is probably about eight to 12 year olds. Then Beef and Lamb has done a great um, little clip, video clip. I'm sure many of you have seen it called Value Your Food about not wasting beef and lamb and what you can do with it. There's one, I think this is MPI. They've got feeding food waste to pigs and it's a kind of a cute little YouTube video. And then the last one is a quite serious one, which is about three and a half minutes which I wanted to show, but it's really long and probably a bit dry, uh, why we need to change the food system. But if you Google any of those, you can find those. Okay, coming back to the sustainable development goals. So food waste and having food waste, having, 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 having food waste in half, 50%, okay. Um, it falls under uh, 
the SDG 12, okay, which is responsible consumption and production. It's actually target 12.3. And so when you hear this, target 12.3, I'm sure you've heard of Food Waste Champions 12.3, okay? So they've got the champions, 12.3, uh, and then you can be a citizen of 12.3. So, you know, anybody can join up and do that. And there's so much happening in this space right now with food waste. It's just amazing in the last couple of years, particularly with COVID. Um, and basically the New Zealand Food Waste Champions 12.3 is accelerating progress towards achieving sustainable development goal target 12.3 in New Zealand and having food waste by 2030. It's quite an ambitious goal, this 12.3, I think. So we know that food waste is a problem. Okay, now this is an old study. Uh, a lot of you who work in food waste will have seen this. This was done, I think, 2014, 2015. So it's been a while, but around by Love Food, Hate Waste, uh, New Zealand. Okay. And it was done in coordination or conjunction with the University of Otago. Miranda Morosa was involved with this and um, the Wastemans. And so there's the infographic on the left. Okay. $872 million wasted New Zealand's food scandal. And we've even got Dunedin in there saying that we could feed Dunedin twice over. What are the top wasted foods? Every student who takes my first year paper knows this, okay? Bread. Bread, 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 Okay, and then we've got leftovers, we've got oranges and apples, and then we got our fruits, okay? And then we got our potatoes, and then we've got about a chicken and a bit of beef. So there's actually a lot of things that we're wasting. And of course, when you think about the amount of energy and resources that go into some of these foods, you think about how much we're kind of, you know, throwing away. I want in particular to talk about bread. Okay, because bread links up, you'll find out, with a lot of different nutrients. Okay, so bread in particular, because bread is quite cheap to make. And it says at the bottom, 22 million loaves are thrown away each year. Now, this is, this is old. So I'm going to talk about the Adult Nutrition Survey. That came up a lot in the, in the conference last week, people talking about the Adult Nutrition Survey. Uh, it's called a Focus on Nutrition. We're going to look, there's key findings. This is online, so you can access this. And this was done in 2008, 2009. We're hoping that there'll be another one. I don't know, maybe by 2025, we're not really sure. Uh, this was a national uh, study, a cross-sectional study of 4,721 adults aged 15 years and older. Okay, and they collected a whole variety of, of information, including dietary information. Okay, so I've just put that summary up there just to remind people who may not know that we have this information. This is accessible to anybody. You can get this information online to find out what people are, right, are eating. I get questions sometimes asking me, what do people eat? And they ask, and I think, why don't you just go onto the website and you can find this information out. So this information is all freely available, paid by public money to do these studies. The information is there. So bread, okay, bread is the top food wasted. So I've got a couple of pictures you can see I'm, I'm always, screenshotting everything off the web. Um, but you can see we've got over there on the big picture of bread at the supermarket. We've got a whole variety. There's quite a lot of Bergen loaves, but then we've also got, you know, your kind of standard loaves. And then we've got our bakery bread. Okay, the bakery bread as well, which looks lovely. I put it there, it's whole grain. You can bear, I could barely see it close up. Looks like $8 for a loaf. Okay, so we're talking big time money, right? Um, for those loaves, eight to ten dollars at some of these bakeries. Okay, whereas these ones, these loaves, what one to two dollars per loaf, so much cheaper. But when the adult nutrition survey, and I've got people in the room, which is great, looked at bread, they just put all those breads together, and I suspect the bulk of the bread was the stuff from the supermarket, right? Yes. So Liz is look like this. So whenever Liz says this, then I know that I, what I'm saying is right. Okay, so. The interesting thing about bread is when we look at the nutrients in bread, it actually tops the list. Now, thinking about gel, I'm not sure, but I know I'm going to present it because this is what's in the, in the results. Bread tops the food list, okay, as the greatest source of energy in the typical adult New Zealand diet because we eat a lot of bread. It's cheap, fills people up, okay, but it's also a good source of protein, tops the list for protein. People don't think of protein and bread and protein. They think of meat. Tops the list for carbohydrate, not surprising. Tops the list for dietary fiber. Tops the list for vitamin B1. Tops the list for iron. Amazing. Tops the list for sodium too. Not such a good thing. 
Okay. But look at that. It is full of good nutrition. It's full of nutrients. So when we think about food waste, we think about the climate and the environment, but we need to also think about, you know, all the nutrients that are there. And poor bread, I do feel that bread is very maligned, but it is actually a really good source of so many different nutrients, even that stuff that you get in the supermarket, which is perfectly fine food for people to eat. Um, what was I going to say something else? No, I'm forgotten. Okay. There have been a number of papers that have published. This is recently uh, published in the Inter International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health uh, earlier this year by a group of a uh, couple of people from Ireland. And they didn't just look at bread, they looked at lots of foods, okay? And what you can see is in this table, this is uh, kind of a scoping review, these are the nutrient losses embedded in food waste per capita per day recorded by studies examining nutrition quality. So we not, don't have just energy and protein and carbohydrate and fiber, but there's also other vitamins and minerals in there. So, you know, we've got a lot of um, nutrients in the food that we're wasting. And that's great because we're rescuing a lot of food too, and we're giving those to, to people. So it's good that it's not going to waste because then that nutrition go, can be passed on. So I have to put in here, that bread also is a good source of selenium. It tops the list for selenium. Surprise, surprise. Again, people didn't know that. And iodine. Now, I've guessed at the iodine, I don't know, 30%? I'm not really sure. We don't really know. I don't know. Well, next week we might. Yay, next week. So, and that's important because I'm sure many of you know that in New Zealand, we have naturally low levels of certain trace elements in our soil, selenium fluoride and iodine. And I don't think Muriel Bell would, she'd be wondering, well, what, this is, this isn't quite different from her time. So I've got this off Science Media Center. There's a Science Media Center that you can get some really, it's for high school students. It's actually very good. Um, and they've got Muriel Bell up there and they've got dates and times. And I was just thinking that Muriel, I've got a little emoji. I'm not very good at emojis, but this little kind of like puzzled emoji, wondering why, you know, this work that she did in the 1920s and 1930s, and we put iodine in salt, but now it's in bread, you know, and how that happened and why are we doing that? And that only happened in 2009. And she might also be wondering about, you know, the work that was done on fluoride and tooth decay, but only this year in 2021, did we finally pass the bill for water fluoridation to go to, uh, to health board. So it is interesting. How much have we progressed? I've just put that as a side. I'm not too far off from being finished. So coming back to food waste, that was a segue, I had to do that. Um, coming back to food waste, we've got a lot of food that is wasted. And of course, I can't not mention my colleagues who work with the food waste innovation um, theme. I've got, you can see Miranda's down here. Phil is in the audience, so thank you, Phil. And then we've got Dave McKenzie sitting down. He's holding this little kind of like, children's ride on cow, I think, which I took home, which for my grandchildren who didn't really think much of it. Um, and yeah, so I think that this group is doing a lot. We're trying to do a lot of research within New Zealand, looking at ways that we can both um, measure the amount of food that's wasted, uh, find out ways to change behavior, and also come up with technical innovations to do something with that food waste. Last week, Miranda Gaeta gave a really good talk on upcycled foods, and I'm not going to talk too much about upcycled foods, but what's interesting from a nutrition point of view is given um, that there's an increase in the different numbers, the numbers of upcycled foods around the world, okay, and if we take one product and it's food waste and we divert it into an upcycled food, if it's bread, it's going to have all those nutrients in it. And then that's going to go into the food product. So we need to analyze it. Okay. And that's another thing. But we also just need to make sure that we keep up with this trend when we think about food composition database. So I've just kind of put that in there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a you know, great group. And we've got lots of students and Trixie and Grace and um, Jessica. There's a whole range of people involved with this, with this group. So finally, I'm moving on to food. I don't have two more slides. I can't do this without um, showing my grandson, uh, my, my, I've got more than one, um, but this grandson uh, and talking about food. Okay, and when do we learn to make these food choices? Um, so of course, here he is, he in the pumpkin field, that's not New Zealand. 
Um, and then here he is uh, deciding on how much he loves that fluffy um, at quite a, an expensive cafe in Wellington. And then at his home in uh, Tyrapati, in Kaiti, having his birch or muesli, okay? And, and enjoying it very much with a very big spoon, it seems to me. So when we look at food, okay? I've been talking a lot, a lot of the diagrams I gave have been quite kind of like English Western Pakiha. Of course, we have a whole variety of different ways of eating food and often they're in bowls or other containers. And I thought I better put this up just to acknowledge that, but to acknowledge that I've missed out all that. And we do need to have a much wider perspective um, than we have. And I think actually the American guidelines are, are kind of addressing that. So how do you decide what to eat when you make your food choices? Okay, so got these visual guides up here. There's the Canadian one, there's the uh, Heart Foundation, and then we've got our Eat Lancet one. Okay, how do we decide? But I think you can see that recently a lot of the evidence or the guidance for individuals is to eat more vegetables and more plant-based diet and to, to lower um, our intake, particularly within a New Zealand context of um, animal, animal foods and animal products. This is the, ED, the Eat Lancet Dietary Pattern, again, from that uh, journal article that I talked that was in Nature, it's not really a journal a comment, really. And this is what they say, okay, about the Eat Lancet. They say they ended up with a diverse and mainly plant-based meal plan. The maximum red meat in the 2,500 calorie per day diet allows in a week for an average weight 30-year-old is 100 grams or one serving of red meat a week, okay? That's kind of guidance. It says that's less than one quarter of what the typical American consumes. Ultra processed foods, such as soft drinks, frozen dinners, reconstituted meats or ultra processed meats, sugars, fats, there's a lot of other ultra processed foods in that category than just those foods are mostly avoided. And of which we eat, there's lots of more and more evidence showing the increase in the amount of unprocessed, uh, of highly processed um, foods in our diet. So this, again, I keep saying these, um, a lot of these uh, websites and got the Guardian, the BBC, they take these science papers. So this one is um, written by Poor and Nemesek. You can see in 2018, it was published in science and the BBC actually turned this into a great um, visual guide. And so what you can see is it says at the top, beef has the biggest carbon footprint but the same food can have a range of impacts. And I think that's important. Okay, so where we can see that beef, we can have a low, this is not even working. This is, has a low impact. Uh, we're probably down for New Zealand, closer toward the low to average than at the high impact and then lamb, et cetera. And then they go down and say a portion of the highest impact vegetable proteins emits less than the lowest impact animal proteins. So I think it's important when we're choosing foods to think about the foods we're choosing to eat but also think about what foods we might leave behind on the plate. Because if we've got beef or lamb, I don't, I don't know, I guess we shouldn't leave that behind on the plate because there's more everything, there's more resources that's gone into that food than has into some of the other foods. So I just think that's something to think about. Um, Michael Pollan, you can't read this. He's a well-known American writer, food writer, said many years ago, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. So coming back to New Zealand, okay, and to the sundial study, which I said was of New Zealand adolescent girls aged between 15 and 19, how much of the New Zealand diet is coming from plants? And so this is the work that Ema did. And what I want to show you is in fact, in, even though we're not meeting the Eat Lancet targets, about 70% of our energy is coming from plant foods. I think that's higher than a lot of people would guess. And in fact, the vegetarian girls, and there wasn't a large sample of them, is about 84%, okay? So not a huge difference. The other thing that you should look at in this slide is the range, okay? There are omnivores who are eating more plant-based energy than the ones who identified as vegetarians, okay? So there's a range within that. And I think that's important to think about that. Now, someone suggested to me that maybe we should flip this around and think about the animal-based energy, okay? Because this doesn't look that different. But in fact, if we think of how much energy is coming from animal foods, 30% of energy in the omnivores and actually 
15 or 16 percent. So it's actually double. Okay, so if you look at it from that way, it's a little bit different. So how do we change behaviors? Um, well, I like to talk about Garden to Table, which is a, a, a group of wonderful people who are trying to get children to grow and harvest and learn uh, where fruits and vegetables come from. And then they grow them and they learn you know, all about them and how much effort it takes to grow them. And then they cook them up and then they share them. Uh, and this is a lovely article about Manaki Tonga and about how that kind of whole process of hospitality and sharing of food comes across. And I think that's really important. So second to last slide, lick the plate clean. Yeah, I don't know that maybe we can, you know, have a discussion about that. I mean, I've had a little bit of flack from a few people, I won't name who they are about, you know, the picture and about, you know, lick the, isn't that like rude? What about culturally? What about portion sizes? I don't know. It's a kind of interesting thing. What about, you know, portion and obesity? We're told to leave stuff on the food. I don't know. Maybe we have to rethink that, lick the plate clean. Maybe we should cry over spilt milk. Not sure. And so last slide is there's a picture of Muriel Bell, a little bit older. And something that I think that I got from is from 1914. Okay, and thinking about Muriel in those times and how much we have progressed or haven't progressed, but it says food, buy it with thought, cook it with care, use less wheat and sugar, buy local foods, serve just enough, use what is left, don't waste it. Thank you. Good. Wow, thank you so much, Sheila, for that very thought-provoking presentation. You, you really did take us on a, a huge journey of reminding us firstly about the evidence-based uh, guidelines and how it's important they're evidence-based, but they also have to be compatible with planetary health. So I think that was a really nice reminder. And then reminding us to also uh, make sure that we take into account other nuances such as behavior change and um, food waste. And I really love this last slide. I think it's it's marvelous. So for the Muriel Bell lecture, we don't have questions, uh, which Sheila did remind me about yesterday. So uh, we don't take questions. So on behalf of the Nutrition Society, and I think the whole audience as well, Sheila, I'd really like to thank you for such a, a thought provoking uh, presentation. I know these things take a lot of time and effort. So uh, thank you very much and much appreciated. And thank you everybody for attending today. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Bye. Great.